we love having a small group because we're a bit villagey ourselves and we couldn't manage to sit on a stage. <laughs> so um, if you feel to just come a little bit closer so it's not so conventional, it would be really wonderful. And we promise not to call on you or pick on you or anything horrible. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, and if they don't, all the right people are here. So we're quite chilled about that. Mm. I think I wanted to start with a little small story of coming here and then to introduce these incredible people. And then we imagined a little bit more of each of us talking um, seven or ten minutes and having a bit of a chat and being able to talk amongst ourselves. So you would be thinking a bit, it would be a bit more of a conversation and less of a huge big talk. Yeah. So um, I'm Eve, Eve Annika, and I'll just say one of the things about different kinds of activisms is something called magical realism, where we start seeing the world slightly, slightly askance. And when I arrived at the station, I'd, I tried to just say, okay, well, here I am. And I came across this father and daughter, young daughter, and she announced that when she's in um, her code name, when she's going to be here and playing in her code game, her code name is Pink Bomb. And she had pink leggings and a pink jacket, and she's ready. And I looked a little bit, and I thought, well, that's interesting. And as we got on the taxi, there were these two amazing young women. And one was saying, oh, no, I'm doing a talk at, at, at medicine. I'm doing a talk on lucid dreaming, and I'm just going to show people how to live in a dream world. And I thought, okay, now we're getting right into this, perhaps. And as we arrived, there was this torrential downfall, yeah, downpour, and we was absolutely drenched to the bone. And within very short, there was a rainbow that had arrived. And at the same time, this, I, I discovered I was in a tent next to the artists. And one of them was definitely a magician because he was shooting out these huge, huge bubbles. You know, when we were little, you had little bubbles you could blow. So we had this thing that had this magnetic, gigantic bubble floating towards here. And I loved sleeping next to them because they dressed up in gold and in leggings that you've never seen the like of ever. And there was a sense of a whole fantasy that had arrived. And when I looked at our title, which was, I, I had moderated a session with the elders on um, ancestors and how our ancestors come into our lives as the invisibles. And so that had already alluded me to, there was a whole nother magic level happening. And I think the trick with this activism's business is it can be very, very awkward because we imagine that if we're good and healthy and true, that good and healthy and true things will happen around us. And in yesterday came a deep reminder to me of a, a personal thing of death. And I spent quite a bit of the time in the forest. And I reminded myself that our world has this thousands of fantasy levels and at the same time the big one which is the one that's so present in our world now, in the violence, in um, a ref sometimes a refusal to see death as present, and then when it is, a sort of exquisite beauty. And when I thought about our session, reimagining activisms, and it has an S on the end on purpose, because so few of us see ourselves as activists, I think, or maybe some of us do, but it's a certain kind of activist. And what did reimagining activisms look like in terms of community healing and repair? So I didn't know how to introduce us. Akim, his story is about spiritual practice through dance as liberation to take ourselves into a different kind of realism completely. And I, got, I still got goosebumps to imagine dance as 
liberating, yes, I know that, and a spiritual practice, and then bringing it all together, this exquisiteness of joy. His pluck is joy. And as activists, we got so tired, we got so burnt out. So this beauty of joy. And then D, who has the shortest bio, about six lines, full, full, full of food, <laughs> of a cook, of a community food educator. And, and you know, then a by little thing, urban agriculturist, cook of the year, you know, associate at Coventry. It's utterly irrelevant. She's a cook. She loves food. And once again, this imagination of um, different fantasies. Like, oh, wow, there's now joy through dance and food. And then another extraordinary soul. And I so love this title. You know, I'm South African. I've come through Gaul. Is dark optimisms. You know, dark optimisms, culture and carnival. Culture and carnival in an aftermath. And so mine was about sacred activism and what on earth that meant in a world that's got this, this much insanity. It's basically batshit crazy. What on earth does that mean? And do we have to follow a toe the line of a, a Gandhi, a Mandela, a Martin Luther King, you know, um, Petra Kelly? What is this? So what we imagined was um, each of us, as I said, talking. We hope to start with Sean and then ask ourselves questions. We are a bit villagey. We're useless without hugging. We, we're not so good at being able to talk at. So we hoped that somehow we can, you can just chat and ask us anything you might think of asking us, and we'll see how it goes. We're making it up as we go along because we basically think the world is making itself up as it goes along too, and that we're deeply confused. And we basically also think we have to stay in the confusion because those of us who are pointing it out of us, you know, pointing too quickly, um, maybe they just want to control it more. And we'd like to just sit in this mess because in that something else seems to be lurking. Mm. <laughs> Will you start? Yeah. <laughs> Certainly, yeah. Thank you, Eve. Um, so I'm not really going to introduce myself because... I'm a person, and what I've done, if it becomes relevant, I'll maybe mention it later. But as you've mentioned, my, my life and my work's gone under this name of dark optimism, um, and that's the kind of energy that I'm speaking from. And my first controversial statement of the session is, you know, we're sitting here at this wonderful festival of sustainable living, um, and I think sustainability is a fundamentally misguided concept for where we are right now for two reasons. Firstly, because... Uh, to pick one fact out of many, um, uh, most of the wild creatures on Earth have gone in the last 50 years, not been replaced, you know, died and not, not come back. Um, not species, but individual creatures. So sustainability is impossible. Secondly, sustainability is undesirable. Like, this is a society that we live in which is omnicidal, which is destroying everything that we love and care about, and I have no desire to sustain it. So let's put sustainability on the side, for starters. Um, so what we do know is, like, we tend to think of the situation at the moment as being one where everything needs to change, but it's so overwhelming, and all these big, powerful entities are trying to keep things the same, and, like, how can we possibly make a difference? And I want to turn that on its head as well. Like, radical change is coming, one way or another. Like, either we change direction, or we end up where we're headed, and neither of those look like today. Like, consequences are landing now, collapse is happening now around the world, and we live maybe in this shrinking circle of affluence where we can still imagine that everything's fine and can continue. So, radical change is coming, one way or another. The question is how we prepare for that, not how we cause it, how we shape it, maybe. So, we live in an age of collapse. Um, all the structures and things that we're used to finding our security in are not reliable. Um, I've spent the last couple of weeks with friends from Venezuela telling me about the currency collapse there. You know, how does your life look if suddenly your savings become worthless? Like, we've become very used to looking for our security in money. And 
believing that we're only a responsible human being if we're, if we're financially independent, you know, if we're taking care of ourselves, we're not a scrounger, we're not a parasite. And so my second controversial thing to say today is that financial independence doesn't exist. Um, even if you're incredibly rich, financially speaking, and you can pay for everything that you need, you're not independent. Someone still grew your food. Someone still built your house. Someone still produced all the things that you consume. So all that money allows you to do is to be dependent on people you don't know instead of being dependent on people that you do know. That's all that financial independence is, and yet that's what our culture tells us is, is the, the essential criteria for being a responsible human being, right? It's taking care of yourself, your own financial needs. So where does that leave us if we aren't trying to be financially independent anymore, which is what most of us spend most of our time doing in this culture, and sustainability is impossible. <laughs> where are we? Um, and where we are is in what you might call a post-collapse world, a world where all the certainties that we've grown up with and been raised in are crumbling. The things that we used to look, for, look to for security are no longer there anymore. And I've become a sort of carrier for the work of my, my late mentor, David Fleming. Uh, and these are his books, which, which I brought to posthumous publication. Um, and he, sort of 20 years ago, realized uh, that this is where we were headed. Um, he was a sort of, uh, he was involved in starting the Green Party in this country. He was a sort of radical economist involved with the Soil Association. But he got really fed up because he realized, you know, we can all say that endless growth on a finite planet is impossible and know that it's true. But after 10 or 15 years of campaigning on this, he realized this story isn't going to get through. Like, the, the systems are too powerful, the vested interests are too powerful for us all to suddenly see this cultural great turning and wake up to sanity and avoid where we're headed. So then the question for him became, okay, so if that's not what's going to happen and we're going to head off the cliff, how can we start preparing for that now? Like, what, what's life going to look like after that? And as a historian, he said, well, this kind of growth-based, market-based capitalist system, depending on where you draw the line, it's only been around, say, a couple of hundred years. Well, how did humanity survive and thrive for the couple of hundred thousand years before that? And I won't say much now, and hopefully it'll come up in conversation, but the essence of the answer is that in the absence of economic growth, what sustained good lives is culture. It's actually people caring about each other, hanging out, playing together, art, music, creating bonds of care and love and support that are not in any way connected with the financial economy. And the financial economy, as anyone who's studied it will know, can evaporate overnight. It looks so solid right now, but it's such a fiction. It's just a confidence trick. What isn't a confidence trick is culture and community and relation, and that is what the post-collapse future has to be built in and what we need to get on with. Let's, let's. Can you hear? Yeah. So that's such a beautiful spot for D to start, perhaps? Um, Is that what sustained good lives? Culture? Community? Um, yes, it is. Um, but before I get into anything, I'd like to ask everyone here a question. What does food mean to you? <laughs> yeah. Yep, gathering together. Sustenance. No. Connection with land. Nutrition. Uh, food as medicine. Ex yep. Uh, creativity. Color. Pleasure. Love, all right, for me, that was, you know, food is all these things, but for me, food is love, yeah? Food and cooking is my lo love language, all right? And it is a love language that I use in community to bring community together and, and to heal the most underserved and marginalized people in our society. Um, you know, food in 
in our current economic system is seen as a commodity and it doesn't see all these aspects that we, you know, all, all just shared. And for us to reclaim community, to build community, to build our cultures, we need to reclaim those aspects of food. So that is the basis of the work I do. So from the grassroots, growing food together, cooking food together, eating and sharing food together. And during this COVID pandemic over the last six months, you know, we've had to do a lot more food aid where the big food and supermarkets and government, you know, no one could really feed people. And it's been communities who've come together and, you know, donated food and grown food and shared food. Our farmers coming together to make sure that people can eat. But donation is not sustainable. All right, what our government is doing is not sustainable. All right, because we are feeding into a system that is raping our earth, that's destroying all our biodiversity, that is oppressing people, oppressing people right here and oppressing people in global south. And the roots of that capitalism lies in slavery and indentureship and the racism and patriarchy, you know, that, that keeps it going. And for me, the most powerful thing you know, that we could do with food is disrupt that system, all right? And, you know, I think that is why my work is so powerful because I'm disrupting within a system, you know, within government, um, within sort of all these international spaces from a place of love, all right? Because we all want to belong. We all want to connect and food transcends all barriers. So where I work in Northwest London, little corner in Brent, you know, we have almost 400 languages spoken. And I speak English and very bad French, very bad Spanish, right? And that's why I said food is my love language, right? And it is a language that transcends all these borders yeah, of young and olds, of black and white, of yeah, people from elsewhere. It just brings us all together. And we have created a space and, you know, we take that space wherever we are, where everyone is welcome. When we started, I went up. I'm a firm believer of meeting people where they are. So I went out and walked the block, yeah, with all this, um, and just spoke to people and said, come, leave your alcohol outside, <laughs> all right, because we can't have alcohol in there, all right, but come, just come and eat a meal. That's it, that's all we're doing. And, you know, all those horror stories, all, all those, you know, those, those, that sadness, all, all what people are carrying, you know, it stays outside the door because for a couple of hours they can sit and they could laugh and they connect with people who, who they wouldn't normally connect with. You know, and I'm talking mentally ill people, people who are sleeping rough, you know, people who are lonely and have no friends, no family, right? We all come together and we create that community right and we create that healing for ourselves and build that resilience so we can take on the world together so um it, it, it's going down its little spiral this idea of Culture, community, and care. What's the spa well, The philosophers always ask three questions when they sat around, the Western philosophers anyway, 2,000 years ago. And they would, you know, drink coffee and 
smoke whatever, they had a lot of it, and then they would say, okay, who am I? What makes a good life? And what makes a good society? And I, it sounds to me as if on our magical realism journey that we're talking about something a little bit similar. What sustained good lives? Our cultures, our communities, our care. Um, who are we if not exactly, exactly, exactly what we eat? Whether we eat nothing and we're emaciated and hungry, or whether we eat extraordinary food that's of our local space and our bodies shiver because we recognize it. Or whether somebody walks down our street and says, come and have a meal, because we are going to find each other in different ways. She doesn't say that. She says, come and have a meal. And people look at her maybe as if she's a bit stark, graving mad. But they will come. And in that, what I think you said, that connection with in gathering, something changes. You can't say what it is. Nobody wrote an NGO banner with a mission and a vision and a, you know, action statement. Uh -uh. But something changed. And we are interested in that. What's that? So, Akeem. Hello. <laughs> Um, <coughs> so, it's, oh, it's, such, it's such a great experience to be here. It's, uh, I'm really grateful um, to be next to these two amazing people and to be in front of you. Um, I dance, but we all dance. Dance is just innate. It's within our being. Our heartbeat is our first dancer. And then our body Within embryology, literally, our heart tells our body to make itself, to dance, and then we are created. Look it up. Embryology is great. Um, our ancestors have always danced. They dance for everything. If we're going to have a meal, we dance. We're gonna, it's going to rain, we dance. We're going to start a fire, we dance. When did we lose this? When did we lose this? When you watch a child and you put on music, even before they can walk, they, they're exploring their spine. They're exploring what, what, it, what happens if I lift my head like this. Okay, so what happens if I roll over like this? They're making themselves. The patterns are innate. It's patterns. And we all have those patterns, hence why we all have five fingers, we all have five toes. Some people are born with six, you know, them special ones. And sometimes they're webbed, you know. It's cool, it's cool, We're, it's, all, it's all accepted, you know what I mean? Um, I, I came to dance through needing to express myself. I was a very shy child, I'm still a bit shy at times, and I, I don't like to talk to people. So I, I used to look for opportunities to, to dance, and that would help me break the wall. That's what I've come to realize from reflecting on it. And then I went to dance school, and I learned ballet and contemporary and all this stuff. And I remember in between classes, some of the other students are like, oh, I'm sick of, we're just doing the same thing every day. Yeah, we are, but we're still dancing. But they didn't feel like that. And I've come to realize it's because of my upbringing. I was raised around music. Every morning, my auntie's playing this loud music, and you have no choice but to dance, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so when it comes to dance school and being in that space, it just, I was, I was doing ballet, but to me, I'm, I'm hearing the music. I'm connecting to the frequencies. It, it's not, oh, I'm just doing technique so that I can be a better dancer. No, I'm, I'm dancing because Akeem, loves to dance. And it's that, the love. Sometimes we lose that because we watch Beyonce and we watch Michael Jackson and we watch all these icons who are amazing dancers. But then we separate ourselves from them. We go, oh, they, they done that because da, 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 da. But well, you can do it too. Like, wh why did the four-year-old, talking about myself again, watch Michael and just try it? Just try. I didn't get it the first time. A moonwalk is... Semi-difficult. By the time I was six, mastered it. <laughs> you know? You, you keep trying. And then beyond that, forget the name of the, the style of dance. Forget the, 
the, the, the genre and all this kind of thing. Shake your body. When a reindeer is attacked and they have that trauma in them, it's innate. They have no choice but to shake, to get it out. Because our bodies is, is like a computer. It, 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 it stores the data. It stores those memories. You know, someone stepped on my toe the other day, oh, and that just boils up. Then next week, you smash the glass on the floor, and you're like, oh, why did I do that? I don't know. That's making it up. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's an innate thing uh, for us to release. So that's my mission. My mission and my tool, my activism, is to hold spaces where people can just drop in and feel the music, remember their heartbeat, you know, remember the, the wind touching your skin, remember the, those things that just make you, make you want to stop talking because words just do not do it justice. Your expression, your physical expression is the only thing that can come close because it's divine. And I'm going to end it there. Have we lost it? When you say, why have we lost it? Have we? No, we haven't. It's just that it's been organized in a certain way. We, we say in the industrial age, we, we saved it for the weekend. So that's why, you know, drinking came in, you know, having your alcohol and this and that to help you get to that place. Although our ancestors did, you know, use substances to help to bring it to another level. But the drum was the first substance mm. because the drum is the, f is the heartbeat. It reminds us of being in the womb. And it takes, a, the, the, you know, in the voodoo tradition, the voodoo drummer master knows, okay, if I drum this pace or this rhythm, I'm going to take you here. And then if I take you from, and then if I change it to here to there, I'm going to take you to another place. That's, the, that's science. That's, that's, that's an art yeah, to itself. Yeah, yeah. And that's not forgotten, it's just that the, um, the attention's being placed somewhere else. Mm. Our commercial Western society, globalization, McDonald's, Burger King, has taken us to look this way. Mm. Look over there. Look on the TV. Look at that. Yeah. Don't remember that, oh, I was in the playground the other day, and I, my friend was just singing this song, and I just felt like, you know, don't remember that but focus on this, yeah, yeah. you know? That's what's happened, really. But we haven't forgotten, because it will always be there. It's in our DNA, so it's, it's just about unearthing it. The, the same philosophers you mentioned said, we don't learn anything, we just remember. Exactly, yeah. So I don't want to make any assumptions in this group, but do you all dance? Do you all suddenly, you know, all of you, someone looking but shy, like I might say, well, please do. <laughs> but I will promise I won't. Um, please? Could I please, please, please. Dance, um, actually. <laughs> well, I'm going to say it in words first, but I, I speak much more naturally in dance than words myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, there's just a short uh, extract from, from my late mentor's book that I think speaks to this a lot, and it's from Homer. So way back 700 years before Christ, um, Homer wrote about how the, the art and the music and the dance of the ancient dream world lay in wait to seduce Odysseus and his crew as they were about to encounter the sirens whose bewitching song lures everyone who hears it to their death. Their bodies added to the pile of moldering skeletons in the meadow where the sirens sat. But Odysseus's mistress, Circe, the goddess who lives on the island of Aea, advised him to block the ears of his crew with wax so that they wouldn't be able to hear the siren's song. And then they wouldn't be distracted from the real work of rowing, which is what it's really all about. But he himself was tied to the mast, so securely strapped there, he could now listen to the siren's voices with enjoyment, as Circe puts it, and without being drawn irresistibly into their power. And David writes, this has various interpretations but one of them makes it a decisive detachment from art. 
The sound of ancient myth, which once drew its hearers in without means of escape, is rendered sensible and civilized, reduced to a concert, a sort of Hellenic music evening with female chorus, and perhaps a professor of Greek to tell us something about the local legend that lies behind it. On this view, we see in this story the breaking of the link between art, music in this case, and politics and culture. Now you only need to buy your ticket, be a spectator of the arts for an hour or so, and then home for herb tea and bed. <laughs> I love that so much. I could, could I just... Yeah, 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 yeah it's, but it's, then I want to yeah, talk about yeah, how food yeah, fits in with yeah, this. Yeah. Okay, this is a good African village now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now. It's the spectator culture. Yeah, the spectator, yeah. you know, we've become, oh, sit back, watch and enjoy. But there needs to be a time where we, we, we congregate, you know, the, the, it, within some indigenous communities. I know that there's a, a, a tribe in the Congo. They don't have a, a, a word that differentiates dance from music. Exactly. It's the same. W the one word describes the same thing because one does not live without the other. Even if you're dancing without music, your, the wind, the sound of the wind and the air and your breath and your heartbeat is your rhythm. And it's in there and it's existing. It's beautiful. Um, so I don't know how many people were here late last night and we were just dancing. And I think at one point there was just a beat on that was just monotonous. Yeah, it was just this ch 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 right? And then people started drumming and started playing instruments and you could just feel that energy shift and change and that vibration rise and it's like a lot in food we eat you know when it when it's colorful right when it's fresh right when it's cooked with love yeah you know you could feel a change in energy as I described to someone with my lunch earlier, it was a mouthgasm, <laughs> all right, all right, and all right, and I was literally, you know, it, yes, it's like in my body, embodying <laughs> that food, yeah, because it filled me with with joy and nutrition and love and yeah, everything. So I used to be a dancer, believe it or not, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right? Yeah, last right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right, but my dancing days are long over, and, and I like to say BC before children. Um, <laughs> all right, but you know, it's like everything is connected, and we live in a world where everything is siloed. And food and dance, and you know, gardening and, and human rights, uh, everything, everything, education, you name it, everything is connected. And I think as humans, that is how we naturally see things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so how do we reclaim that? Yeah, I'm a, a big person with questions. I'm always questioning people. Um, do you have any ideas how we reclaim that? Shall we give a shot to carry on? This is my friend. Would you like to say something? Say again, sorry. Yeah, um, oh, um, so um, again, we talked about vibrations and energy. Everyone's feeling quite inspired and like, you know, but what do we do afterwards, okay? Our responsibility, just my personal belief, is to take action from this talk. And what's even more important is supporting the people on the stage to do the work they do. Very often people want to recreate and do new things, which is fine, but I think, you know, some of the work we do, although it's pleasurable, it's challenging. I, I personally have been to um, Dee's place and similar to the work I do, it's phenomenal, but it's the most vulnerable people in the world. 
Like, you know, they're people completely, dis like, not even considered human beings. And what she does there is transform them and just makes them feel like they are fully human. But the work is demanding. Um, so I would just say, when you leave here, take an action to either support or, you know, um, make a resolution for yourself to make some kind of action to support what we do or for yourself to help in this journey. That's the only thing I'd say. <laughs> but, but I warned you at the beginning that we were going to take our time with this. So we're actually not going to go and take action immediately. Sorry, we're going to hold it. We're going to hold it. We think it's great. But one of the problems, I think, in this old style of activism that my friends are challenging here is that we act too soon. So we land up doing the same old thing that we've always done. Because we gear up, we're ready, we race off, write a proposal, get some funding, got these outcomes, yeah? And um, wonder why that little thing of magic, just that one that we talked about when you ate together or when you dance, or when your services commands, you've actually opened your ears and heard the music, those moments don't happen in a style of activism that's done so well, but it, it's simply the same old thing. So the idea of redirecting our gaze, which is what you said, is our, our gaze has been directed just as much as, um, I know it's, it's hard to criticize good work. That's not my point. The work is good. But we've become commoditized ourselves, not just our food, not just our dance, not just the ways we see our worlds, but in terms of wanting to change our world, we have become commoditized. We answer to our funders, we answer to, we, we try and keep that yearn in our soul. But very much we answer from an anger or a bitterness or a woundedness inside us, which then replicates the same old pattern. We do the same old thing from the same old place. And we get sad when we burn out. And that's another pattern, that if we haven't burnt out, we haven't been a good activist. But you can see the, the activist who's telling a story and their eyes have got a bit dead and they're telling the same old story because they think it's good. And it, the whole energy has dropped like it has now in the room. Oh, God, here we go again. <laughs> you know? And so I think our question then is this radical change. And maybe we could do a round of that. This radic radical is a wonderful word because it comes from the uh, meaning radix, meaning roots. So what's going to shift from the roots, the very roots of who we are? Well, we have to clean out our toilets for one, <laughs> ourselves, ourselves. We have to clean out our shit. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to, there's something about the detachment from art and a detachment from the, can you hear? Okay, a detachment from the divine. And I don't want to stay in the story of the detachment from the divine, but what is that divine? What is that goddess? What is that unbelievable river below the river that transfixes us? And I would love to ask you that. I would love to ask, I'm sorry you have to roar against the sucker, but I will say this one more thing. I come from a Southern African tradition. And in our tradition, we, our ancestors are part of everyday life. But the other thing that's part of everyday life is, is dancing. And when we're like, when we're like what um, Achim is, is saying, we've, we've redirected our gaze. The, our elders will look at us and say, if you can, if you can walk, you can dance. If you can move your arm, you can dance. But what is it then that's grasped our heart when we tell ourselves we can't? Or what is it that's grasped the food we eat and we, we don't have a relationship with it? 
that beautiful relationship where you know exactly where it grew. You knew the fern that it grew next to. You knew, you knew that when it was going to come, it was going to be there. And even if you were far away, you could remember that. Yeah. So what is it that re redirects our gaze back into who we are? Okay. Um, for me, it was really personal in terms of me having a major accident and not being able to walk and learning how to walk and during that, that period also connecting deeply with ancestors, you know, dreaming and, you know, visitations and actually becoming a priest during that time. So I am a Nifa priest in the Yoruba tradition and I always ask for direction and I am also a priest of Oshun, the lake, the goddess of, you know, fresh water, of creativity, of love. So I always ask for guidance so that I flow where I need to flow. So, you know, my own personal priesthood became a community priesthood in everything that I do. And I think, you know, especially in communities and communities who've been so destroyed by the powers that be, that people could recognize light and they could recognize love and they could recognize that this person values me, that this space and this gathering of people value me and that I have dignity within this space. Right? And that's all we want. We just want to live in dignity and be valued and to connect and have that place of belonging. And I think that's why, especially in our urban areas, we fight hard to maintain place. Because we're losing them so fast to developers. I am, you know, for a lot of people, they don't believe in a divine or God or, you know, anything. But love, to me, is the, the most important expression, right? That essence of what God and goddess is, love. Um, yeah, so thinking about reinventing activism, perhaps. Um, my Buddhist friends have a lovely saying, don't just do something, sit there. And I think there's a lot of that needed, that, that reflection um, before action. Um, and I was very interested that you said, Eve, it can be hard to criticize good work because uh, it really tied on something that's touched on something that's real edge work for me at the moment that I'm working on with my mentor is the distinction between good work and my work that I'm constantly invited to get involved with this, that, or the other, to support it, to write something, whatever. And I think, yeah, that's great work. I want to support that. And I'm starting to notice that I spread myself too thin and I don't actually get to the thing that's, that's my work that I know when I sit with it is mine to do. Um, and so I actually, yeah, my... my my practice at the moment is learning to criticize good work <laughs> in terms of my own work and saying, yeah, that's good, but it's not what I'm called to um, and all the stuff I'm not quite getting to. And there's a line from a writer, many of you probably know Wendell Berry. Um, that's really a, a touchstone for me in developing that discernment between good work and my work. Uh, and Wendell Berry wrote, protest that endures, I think, is driven by a hope more modest than that of public success. The hope of preserving something in one's heart and spirit that would be destroyed by acquiescence. Wow. 
And I've been sitting with that a lot. <laughs> because if you're coming from that place, if your work is to preserve something in your own heart and spirit that would be destroyed by going along with how things are being done, then burnout isn't really a thing anymore because everything that you're doing is an expression of who you want to be rather than an obligation because I should save the world. And I think that's, for me at least, the guiding star in distinguishing between good work and my work. My work brings something alive in me. My work preserves something in my heart and spirit that would be destroyed as opposed to the kind of work that leaves you kind of dead and repeating the same old blurb that you've heard a thousand times before because the funders need to hear it. And, um, and I think, I don't know, maybe Akeem, you would add like, don't just do something, dance, right? Because <laughs> like for me as well, like dancing is the only place I can express a lot. And that's where my guidance comes. You know, I'll, I'll go out dancing, I'll dance till I'm completely exhausted. And then I'll wake up the next day and suddenly it's obvious the answer to the thing that just I couldn't get my head around the night before. Um, and it's, it's connecting with those energies which are not the, the thinky energies, but the the primal energies, the, uh, the energies, the sirens, which are in a sing to Odysseus and his crew, um, and not just focusing on your work of rowing through your funding application or whatever it is. Um, and I'll hand over to Akeem now, but then the bigger work is how do we build a society where no, that work is valued? Hand but I'm handing to Akeem for now. <laughs> uh, wow, there's so much just happened um, with the I'm sure. Um, There is something, because uh, what Dee was saying about how, you know, some people don't believe in the divine and, and so on and so forth, but they experience love. And love is so intangible, yet tangible. How you, you can't really explain why you feel this feeling. Could be about someone, could be about something, it could be about... Yeah, something you care about, the work that you do, and the fact that you, you feel like you, you have no choice but to do this. That's literally how I felt before deciding to, to study as a dancer. Because I was, you know, I was going to sixth form college, doing academic subjects, and then I was literally walking down the street and someone gave me a flyer for an A-level dance class in the evenings. And the week before that, I literally said to myself, I'm really hyperactive. I can't be sitting in a classroom all this time. And then that happens the following week. So there's a matter of knowing yourself and a matter of not being afraid to speak what you want. We've all been silenced in one way or another. You know, the, the trickling down of trauma from the patriarchy that exists and the... the the, 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 the dads and the mothers who have worked the nine to five and then the seven to, to 12, two jobs, you know? Yeah. And the stress of that. So it's difficult to give the child the attention they need so you tell them to shut up. Not knowing that shut up is, is closing so much within them. That is the potential for what will eventually save the world. But that is not their intention. Their intention is to just be themselves. And that's what Sean's basically talking about. I, well, we're all talking about that. Just being yourself. <laughs> got to, he, he cleans toilets, that's what he does. He's got to do it. Um, you know, that, that essence is something that is diabolical to what is taking place. You know, because, yeah, that acquiescence, when we, when we decide, oh, I'm going to just... I'm going to shut who I am in a box so that I can feel like I'm a part of the group or I cannot get in trouble, you know? And these things start early, you know? It starts from school. It starts from home, and then it continues in school. That, that silencing of, of the true, authentic human spirit, whether you believe in it or not, it's there, you know? And... Um, yeah, that's what I really feel it is. I, I, I feel in some way my journey from, from personally really helped. I don't know what it is. I, I, was, I, was re I, I feel lucky. I feel really blessed because my mother, my, my mother and my dad weren't together the whole time of my life. But 
both supported me in different ways. Um, when I was like, no, I feel like I need to do this because when I do it, I feel like I'm not even me. Yeah. I feel beyond this physical thing. I'm, I'm just, I'm just, and the joy that I can then give to other people, that is just beyond any money you could give me. And, and that, that is, that is worth something beyond what you could even describe. So why not? Why not journey down that road of the unknown, you know? And, and then eventually, because what I then realized through training and, and whatnot and being in second year, and then we had to learn um, ideas in arts from the 1900s to, to, to current, and realizing that all the ideas of art that we were looking at were very white, European-centric, I then decided to go the other route. I looked at Bob Marley and his effect on the world, and the fact that he's still relevant to this day, which means the world hasn't changed. That's the issue. Um, and, that made me, and then I, I looked a bit further, and I realized he wasn't doing it to change the world. This is just who he was. And that's the message. Know yourself. Be yourself. That's it. Whether you don't know your left from your right, it doesn't matter. You're at a, go to a class where left and right don't matter. Go to an ecstatic dance class. Go to a, a, a five rhythms class. When you know you're left from your right, go to a beginner's ballet class or a beginner's hip hop class. And then, you, and then the thing is, you get to realize, wait a minute, I'm just moving my body within a specific aesthetic. Everything comes from here. So that means it's in all of us, the katak, the, the merengue, the capoeira, the hip hop, the ballet, the baratonatian, the, you know, I could go on. It's all within you. So why not journey down the road, the yellow brick road, and then wish yourself back home. <laughs> I had just fallen in love with all three of you. I went to take you home with me. So there's nothing... Actually, we've really said it all, you know. You should really just go home now. <laughs> but we're going to waffle on a little bit more. Um, it's, it's deceptive, this thing, be yourself. Because what is that? Where do you stop? It's right there. Look at her. <laughs> no, no, look at that child. That's the, what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I love it. No, don't say sorry. Um, so I think for me, there, there are three things that I would add to this self that never stops at our skin. The one is, very recently I got a huge big gift, which was a thing called time. And I decided to do something completely different in my life and went to live in a houseboat, a small houseboat. And all I can feel is the, the tides from the Thames that rise and fall because I wanted to know what was it to live in flow. You know, we read about it and we chant and we meditate and we dance and we cook and we know flow. But what would it be to live in it? So... I suddenly realized, I won't go on long with my story, I suddenly realized that I could tell the difference after nine months. I could tell the difference in the sound of the flight of different birds. I'm an urban person, it's in an urban place in London. I could tell the difference when the swans were flying and when the Canada geese were flying. I started hearing my world differently. And I think in doing that, and in working with people who understood flow, there was something about being me that couldn't separate from this ungendered feminine that made what I used to think of my activism absolutely obsolete. And like all of us, I've probably like the you know, people around us have done good work. And suddenly this strange call of nature, a community of birds, a hermitage, and being able to feel at moments, not all the time, but that connected 
in that strange silence, not the violent silence that you're talking about, not that shutting up, but another kind of shutting up. So nature was the one. The second thing I'd include is, is children. Is, if you imagine living a life inside a womb and coming into a world and starting to learn everything that we learn before we're three, it would take the next 60 years to actually learn as an above three-year-old. A language, culture, moving, dancing, walking, giggling, crying, eating, all of that. And when we hear the, chil the question that children ask, what happens when we die, mum? Where do we go? Why do we, why do we put someone in the ground or why are they... You know, all the questions that children ask are pointing us into a future that we disregard because either they're cute questions or because we know better. But if we follow the dreams of children, what they tell us in the mornings, so there are cultures where dream circle is part of everyday life, where the dreams guide the community, and the elders' role is to be able to interpret a little bit what those dreams are. Not as fact, that's a bit boring, but as what's coloring the day of this community today. But the children attend, and the children's dreams are regarded as more significant. So I wonder when we've redirected our gaze into education that is fact-based or outcome-based or assessment-based, what have we lost in the wisdom of children? This is very extraordinary to me. And I think in a joyous activism where children are taken seriously, we live our life in a different kind of delight, a totally different kind of delight. And I only think that you're clapping for children. <laughs> and my last one I would say is, I think w sometimes we have redirected our gaze from regarding ourselves as fundamentally part of collectives. And you know, I know collectives have got bad press. You know, it's hard to make decisions, we squabble, we, you know, our power gets in the way. Mm. But there's something very different about being in a collective. It's a bit like the animals when there's no predator and they're, they're, they're munching on the savanna and there's a quiet peace and everybody knows that it's safe because even if I haven't thought of what to say, Dee will know or Akim will bring in something or Sean will. And I imagine that if we redirected our gaze towards food and the celebrations of food and dance and this exquisite literature, the, the, the words that, that Sean guides us with, you know, to, to, um, to question what's good work and what's my work. There's such a sense of there's such a sense of e ecstasy, you know, you know, and I'm big on, on we're big on our love, you know. You can hear, <laughs> we love love, and I think we're very big on on accessing. <laughs> on <a> <laughs> my friend, I think we're very big on on accessing that spaciousness that might help us just change an old pattern which we otherwise just frigging walk the same old journey and get the same old broken heart, you know? When you're gonna do something different, for God's sake, do something different and something else might happen. But when we listen for the name of the wind or we can experience Akim's, uh, somebody gives him a, 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 a handout, says go to a dance class, yeah, yeah, shit, I can't stand sitting in class, I'm not gonna do that, I'm gonna go and dance. Then you can have a sense, I think, of the sun coming through the trees behind us. You can have a sense of something that's different that might happen. I'm going on. Why don't you each say something? <laughs> yeah. 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 We can, any, you, anybody can ask us anything. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You. People. People. Anyone got questions? Yeah.
Oh, thank you. I hope you can see over it. Um, yeah, no, first of all, you guys are really inspirational, and I've completely fallen in love with all of you, so thank you. Um, it's been said a lot today um, about knowing yourself, mm. and you guys all, you've talked about being independent, being able to feed yourself. You've talked about expressing yourself. You know, you, 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 t you teach people how to feed themselves and bring themselves together, and... and it, um, and you mentioned earlier this quote when you said, um, uh, what makes, uh, who, who are we, or who are you, and what makes a good society? Mm. It's all intertwined, isn't it? A good society is one that encourages you and shows you and helps you how to be yourself, mm. okay? And if you have that, and if you know your place in society, and if you have a place in society, then you then respect your society and you respect the nature and the place that you live in because you know it. And then we're here because we're talking about activism. And what is activism? I think activism is actually trying again to show people that they're worth it and they, they have a place and they have a value. And if you can bring, you know, I feel like, I guess I don't like the word woke, but you know, some people do go work nine to five, go home, watch Netflix, eat McDonald's. They, 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 no, but maybe, but they don't have a value for themselves. They don't eat good food. They don't respect themselves. They don't feel that they are worth it. My wife and I listened to this, uh, Michael Mead recently, where he was talking about how indigenous societies have rites of passage, right? What is a rite of passage except for showing you that you belong? that you're worth something. You reach a stage in your life, right, you're a valuable part of the community. You matter. And I think that's what we're here talking about, isn't it, really? It all comes down to fundamentally showing people that we all matter, okay? And we all have to believe in ourselves. And that's kind of what I have. <laughs> Thank There's you no very much. <clears throat> I mean, it is that. However we show up in this world, no matter how small you think your gift is, yeah, so it could be bay leaves from your garden that you contribute to the meal, yeah, or you wipe the tables after the meal, all right? You are part of that community and that collective. And, you know, for me, community takes time, all right? You can't do it as a project. So Granville Community Kitchen was 15 years in the making of being embedded in a community and getting to know people and, you know, just knowing when the time was right to actually start something, all right? And we started with love, with intention, with no money, all right? I'm, I'm still extricating half of my kitchen, yeah? from in the community kitchen, all right? And things happen and, you know, it's just grown and it's an organic growth and eventually we have got funding, all right? But we don't chase funding, all right? Because the core of what we do is people and love and dignity and value and the real power that people have, all right? And you know, I've been fortunate throughout my years to really spend time with some amazing elders and amazing women. And I'll always remember what Vandana Shiva told me, right? That I am, work I'm doing is to a higher order, to that divine, yeah? Forget everyone else, forget companies, forget government, forget whatever. My work is to the highest order. Right, and I think that's why I just push through because you know what, my power is ever sustaining. Right, <laughs> right. I don't care if you're a lord, if if you're a multi billionaire, right. If you're chasing, yeah, yeah, no, chasing me with with your heavy military types. You know what, <laughs> right. And that has happened. Um, that does not scare me because love and fear can't live in the same space, all right? Love is my essence. I am love. Everything that I do is love. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, I loved what you said about what activism is. It made me think of the word activate. Like activism is activating people. It's like activatism. Um, it put, put me in mind of this, uh, this line from Howard Thurman, who was one of uh, Martin Luther King's mentors, who said, uh, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive. Because what the world needs is people who've come alive. And it's interesting what you were saying about the deadening, because that quote for me, I've been hearing it a little bit too long now. I'm starting to feel like uh, I'm not going to say that one anymore because it's, it's just, like some people here maybe haven't heard it, but it's, for me it's starting to be like just not quite at the edge. Um, and so I'll say something slightly more controversial, which should make me feel a bit more edgy, which is that I think activism annihilates the concept of the self. Like when you come fully alive, you realize that this concept of Sean as being this, this, this entity it's so weird. Like I'm thinking of it now. It's like a it's like a Russian doll. You know these dolls inside dolls inside dolls. Like there's Sean, fine, but then inside that there's this whole microbiome of bacteria and viruses, and then inside those, you know, there's brain cells, and there's all these different layers of systems going down. And then the other way as well. Like Sean can't possibly exist without all that's inside Sean. Sean can't possibly exist without without friends and without the land and without Gaia and. So this, all of these different layers where we might put this word self, they're just all interdependent. And the more that you, the more you activate, the more that you come into awareness of that, the more impossible it becomes to be selfish in the conventional sense of the word. To think, I'm going to prioritize the well-being of Sean over the well-being of all the other levels that are completely interdependent with Sean. Um, and I'm not sure why, but that brings me to a little story that I heard only recently, um, which is from the time of the Vietnam War. Uh, and there was an activist standing outside the White House with a white candle, uh, protesting, I guess, about the Vietnam War. And this reporter came to him and said, what are you doing? <laughs> like, what's the point? Like, do you really think that national policy is going to be changed by you standing here with a candle? Like, what are you doing? And he turned to her and he said, "Ah, oh, no, no, you misunderstand. I'm not here to try and change the country. I'm here to stop the country from changing me. That's it. That, that's that's because because that, that's what's happened. Like you know, this whole machine that has been created is trying to change what human beings just are. We we can't help it. We're nature, you know. We need our rites of passage, or else we're lost. Hence, gangs. The gangs is to replace that. We innately created the gangs because we needed that sense of tribe, especially when you're a teenager. You know, especially when you're in a, a, a very uh, uh, rough neighborhood and, and mom and dad aren't always there. You know, you're going to need people. You always need people. So you create these spaces. You create a gang. You know, I remember when I was 16, I wasn't, I wasn't in a gang per se, but we danced on the street. So that was our thing. Um, and that felt really amazing. You know, it really anchored me. It gave me... Um, purpose and I saw people who looked like me in, 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 even though we were very multicultural we had a Malaysian guy uh, uh, a guy from Vietnam um, uh, everyone we were all there it was great um, and it, it made me see beyond just myself just my, my the, the, the elements of my identity you know Jamaican British this that da, 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 da. it made me go deeper into the universal being that I know I am and understanding that all these layers of masks that we we have and we can you know we can work into it and, and exist in sometimes they can be used against you sometimes they can be you know used to just distract you and forget about the love that is just it's just there it's always there it's always there you know um so yeah it's it's, it's in that that was just perfect to what i was thinking about the um Rites of passage, because who was it? Uh, the guy who helped George Lucas to create uh, Star Wars. What was his name again? He's a he's a not a philosopher. He's a he's he's a specialist within myth. Yeah. 
Joseph Campbell, <laughs> Yoda. Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph Campbell, yeah. And, <laughs> and Joseph Campbell talks about rites of passage quite a lot. So if you, if you, you, know, you watch uh, Star Wars and you, you see what Luke Skywalker goes through, and he goes through a rites of passage. He, he, he goes through these, it's a journey of the hero. It's an archetype, which we all have. We all have to do that in order to become fully who we are even though we're, we're always that person. It's, it's, fun. it's so much fun. But this whole thing, it's like, oh no, don't enjoy yourself. <laughs> pay the rent, pay the this, pay the that, and, and forget about the journey of exploring the facets of your being. But don't. Do, do the facets of your being. <laughs> oh, now there's too much to be said. <laughs> so... Uh, okay. This thing about ourself. So say there's no such thing, that all we are is an expansion. And that's why it's such a clever question, actually, because we, don't, we know we don't stop anywhere. But it's also not very helpful, because you know, how do you get up in the morning and decide what to wear? You know, whether you're going to go to dance school or not, or, you know, and our ego is alive and well. Mm. Mm. So, I think it's helpful to see the self and community simultaneously. And that as we go through, in many cultures, I think, I think it's okay, safe to say that many rites of passages have been, redi we, we've redirected our gaze from that. We might, if we're lucky, have something at 13, or something at maybe 18 or 21, but ma mainly we've redirected our gaze away from deep and rich ritual deep and rich rites of passage where little girls are able already at seven, seven, to start learning the stories of their ancestors and particularly of their place. Place is not a benign thing. Place comes with contestation, with power, with wars, with um, colonized brutalities. Place has its stories. And little girls come together to start learning already from tiny, that the roles of women arise from this new generation being born. And little boys have their stories about what it means to be a boy. It can be traditional and prescriptive. Nobody's trying to lord it and make it romantic and all fine, it's not. But there does seem to be a way of bringing us into your point, which is about belonging. Yeah, yeah. And then as we know, we know that young men that go off for initiation, that can be up to three years, three years of being in the wild, in nature, learning the lore, L-O-R-E, the lore of the land. Not the L-A-W, that comes later in modern, but the law. Those young men have the gift of what it means to be man. That is not a woman's work to do. And the crisis that in many instances midlife presents is so often because we've lost that incredibly long in, in traditional Southern African cultures it can be up to 14 years of learning to be an elder. You, n you don't kind of, now, uh, now I'm old and wise. It, it, we get, we get as the same as when we were small and there were midwives at our birth. We get birthed into eldering. Well, this is a very beautiful concept, especially if you think we could make up our own now because we're free to do it. It's so cool. And the, I think the last thing I want to say about it is that perhaps if we saw nature as having agency, nature alive, sparkling, dangerous, you know, spend a night in, in an African wild, isn't it's not like sitting in a nice little forest on vigil, you know, where you know people around you being safe. It's scary. So the thing about being not, f not the opposite of love and fear, like you were saying, but being able to confront what it means to be human in a world that's way, way, way bigger than us. And the stars are so far, but they're so close. You know, these are the stories that I think you allude to when you talk about mythology. What, and we've forgotten in a way, our, we've been redirected away from our myths, our stories that connect us to our land. 
And when we learn those stories, we become the one that knows the story of the land. And I think that is just unbelievably cool. It reimagines activisms in totally different ways. And in tr Southern African traditions, a woman, an elder woman, would be called, would be a keeper of the granary. Because the secrets of the land, the secrets of what it means to be human in that land, she holds. See, they're even shrieking with joy about that. <laughs> Shall we go on? Shall we, what should we do? What do you feel like doing? There's some questions. Can we do? Thanks. Um, I just wanted to say something about this word. Oh. The, wo the word self and because um, in psycho-spiritual thinking there's kind of two forms of self, self with a small s and self with a big s and the role of initiation, um, you know, Michael Mead, I love Michael Mead, you know, he, he's written a book called Awakening the Soul and it's... Sorry, you, you know, you're competing with that. Oh, do I need to be a bit louder? Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> um, yeah, so that the role of initiation is awakening to self with a big S, which is also could be called soul. And that through that, we um, lose our identification, our main identification with self, the smallest, which is our ego and our persona. And so through a rite of passage and initiation, we're then able to come back into the tribe with a loss of ego and able to contribute more meaningfully to the whole but also that in connecting to our souls, all of our individual souls are connected to the soul of the world. So we're also deeply connected to nature. So there's a sense of initiation breaking down our smaller self um, and connecting to soul so that we can then be part of the whole. And so I think there's no, it's not that just with a sense of like clinging on to a sense of self is separation, but then, then we find our deeper sense of self, that's when we can make our most meaningful contribution. Um, so yeah, I just want to say that. That's, that's, that's very nice. So as you were talking about the soul, there were these thousand trillion bubbles and people dressed like a carnival, and I think that's the magicality of looking at the world as if it's a magic place. It is, because else wouldn't be happening. Yeah? Yeah, I just wondered if you had one last message for us as parents and as community bringing up children, uh, the next generation of activists. What would you, what would you say, like to say? We have so much to say about this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where, what would you say? Um, let your children be children, all right? And let them discover who they want to be. Um, as a parent myself, I'm, I'm here to guide my children. But children come with such enthusiasm and joy and, you know, want to discover everything. And I think that's why I never sent my children to school. Because for me, school kills children. <laughs> All right? And, you know, that, you're on a learning journey with them. And they will find their place you know, and what it is they want to do. And, you know, I think for me, you know, it's not about activism per se, all right? People find what it is, you know, as we've been saying before, what they are passionate about, what they believe in. So with my daughter, even though she had um, surgery day before, one Black Lives Matter <laughs> protest, she went out because she believed in that. Yeah? And try as hard as I did <laughs> to stop her. All right? You know, it's like she, she went. All right? Because I'm not going to stand it in the way. Yeah? And some, sometimes this is it. We have to let go. We have to stand back as parents and allow our children Right, to make those mistakes or just be, um, you might end up with gray hair like me, which I dye ever so often. <laughs> All right, but it is a journey and it's a journey for us as well. All right, yeah.
just allow our children to be and not try to impress on them your your world. Yeah. Well, I was really struck by what you were saying earlier about people need people, you know, whether it's... I mean, they have a saying, I forget which part of Africa, they have this saying, um, if the children don't feel the warmth of the village, they will burn it down just to feel some heat. Um, like, we need to belong, and if we don't find a healthy belonging, we'll find an unhealthy belonging. Um, and one thing, so one part of my experience was I was involved in sort of helping to create the transition towns movement that some of you might be familiar with. Um, and I think Transitions does a lot of good work. Um, but I think one of the things that's been a real challenge for Transition is that it's a bunch of people who recognize there's a need for community and they want to come together to create community, but are very often doing it from, a, from the perspective of a very conventional middle class establishment kind of perspective. And so they're like, okay, great. Let's all get together every Thursday at seven o'clock and do community. <laughs> and that isn't how community works. And it really struck me what Akeem said about needing people. That's what community is. Community is when you need people. And then if you fall out, you have to make it up because you need each other. You don't just go, oh, well, actually, I'm not enjoying this anymore, so I'm going to go and buy my food at the supermarket instead. Um, and so coming back to children, like what I was saying before, like financial independence is a myth. And that's like what a lot of children in our culture are ways, raised with as they're growing up. You need to get a good education so you can earn money, so you can be financially independent, not be a drain on other people. Don't teach them that. Teach them to need people and to be needed. Because that's where the real relationships happen. That's where the future security is going to be. Um, and... Yeah, like, don't try and be independent. Try and be dependent, and try and be someone that other people can depend on. That's the critical lesson for surviving the future, I think. Um, no, I think I, I have got a little... Something come. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I became a dad last year. Oh. And, uh, yeah, she's great. Um, <laughs> she's literally... She, it, it's... Yeah, because you, you asked the uh, you asked the question of who was it? I can't remember. Was it you? Yes, about you know what should we do to help our kids, our children, but they help us so much. Such a reminder of who you actually are, and and who you want to continue being, and and even you know just the light that is within you, because you see them and you see that light within them, and you're like, wow, how how are they like this? How did I do this? Like, but even though you know it's, you're just the pathway for their reckoning, not their reckoning, their becoming, um, and and that that just puts like I, I it was very humbling, very very humbling to to become a parent um, because yeah it, it's this sense of responsibility but also this sense of just. The fact that we all have that potential, and and that that is something just really powerful, because it in itself is a rite of passage. Yeah, and even whether it's your biological child or it's adopted or whatever, or whether you're a mentor or something, there's this relationship. Because then I look back from having a child, I then look back at when I've worked with kids, and. I've, I've, I've kind of put myself in their position and think of how they, how do they look at me? Who do I, how do I show up for them? And, and, and am I showing up the right ways so that they can make their own decisions and make the right decisions for them? Not the decision they think, oh, Akeem would do this. No, no, no. Their decision for them. And they, they, their, their inner knowledge of who they are. So it's really, it's, it's to, I'd say, because I, I, I haven't been a parent long, so I don't really know, but 